Yeah, we have Uncle Hugh here. Welcome to Ghana, Uncle. Thank you. Yes. Um, we'll just go straight. A lot of people know about you and a lot of people know uh, 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 your legendary Don't art. Don't explain, just for a long shoot. time. From 1987 to now, when you came out with your hit track um, to date, you've been, you've been consistent. You've been going on from grace to grace. What has been what does it? What has been the source of your, you know, a, 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 a strong continuity? Um, I think it's, I think it's passion. You know, I've been a musician since I was an infant. You know, uh, um, my grandmother said um, I came out dancing. Not really, <laughs> but um, uh, that's all I've ever been obsessed with. So. It's more like a possession, so I, wouldn't, I, I, I haven't had to work hard at being passionate about music, you know, I've had to work hard at uh, um, uh, um, uh, perfecting, um, you know, my abilities in what I do. And even now when I leave here, I'm going to practice, you know, and I've been playing the trumpet for 55 years, but I still practice every day whenever I can. I love what I do, and it brings joy to people. Uh, the summit brings solace. So there's a great fulfillment and a great uh, uh, reward. But I work hard, very hard at what I do. And I also um, try to look after my health. So I exercise, I walk every day, I swim. I've been doing Tai Chi for more than eight years. And I do floor exercises. And I try to eat healthy as possible. And then um, I uh, also, you know, I love nature. I'm an environmentalist, and I'm a, a, a farmer by by by. Um, I was raised a farmer, and uh, gardening is also one of my biggest um, uh, obsessions. I write books. I'm an author. I'm a stage actor and theatre producer. And I'm also like working on film production. So, I, you know, the only time I stop is when I sleep. But I don't know if you were born, there was a song called um, Keep On Moving, Don't Stop Now by a group called Soul to Soul. And it's one of my main uh, mantras is that you have to like look after your life, but you have to keep on moving. And you don't sleep, you rest. I think that, um, it's not a secret, but I think that that's been what has what is, what is driven me. You know, many people sleep half their lives away. But I think that you have to work all the time, keep on working. And when you're not working, um, try to be friendly to nature. But also, uh, what is very important is heritage. Because if you don't have heritage in your life, you don't have a past. And we live uh, today, we live very much, uh, even adults today, with complete ignorance about where we come from and, and, and the heritage, you know, and, and, and the rich culture as Africans that we have. We have no idea about it and it's disappearing more and more. Technology to a certain extent is consuming and swallowing us. And um, as Africans, we're actually the only na uh, society and that buys and doesn't sell anything, you know, I mean, except maybe for trinkets here on the roadside and other things. But because we're in a denial of our heritage, uh, we've been convinced by advertisement, we've been convinced by television, we've been convinced by misreading education and also religion. And all those things have like convinced Africans that their heritage is pagan and heathen and backward and primitive and barbaric. And yet there is no society that has as much diversity and wealth of heritage content as Africans. But it's completely invisible and as a result when people come to Africa, they tend to come and look for the animals and <laughs> the geographical sites because they can't find they can't find us you know and um, i think that if we don't sort of restore some kind of heritage into our lives your children 
when they ask them 20 years from now who they are, they're going to say, they say we used to be Africans long ago. Mm. We see it happening even now. You know, there are many homes now in Africa where the mother tongue is not even allowed to be spoken. Mm. And it's a great tragedy for Africans because we're going to become in, uh, uh, extinct sure. as a civilization. Mm. Uh, These are great um, words from you. But I know when you're playing your instrument, the trumpet, the fluji horn, and the cornet, you are very passionate about your instrument when playing it. What really takes over you when you, because a couple of times a lot of people listen to you and they see you play and they get really inspired. What really draws that? Um, an instrument is an inanimate object. You know what I mean? And so you have to work on it, you have to practice it. It's just like that camera you're holding. You know, if you don't work on like well, it on the focus and making sure it's like it's in the right position, you have to know the camera to work it, you know. And I'm sure that you try to like study it to know it better. And if you don't do that, you're just another person with the camera. Sure. You know. So I think anything that you do, if you don't work on doing it properly, you really don't get anywhere with it. And like I told you, like when I leave here, I'm going to the hotel. And I'm going to practice my horn for at least an hour and a half to two hours. And I do that every day whenever I have the chance. I think that whatever craft you have, you have to like really work it hard. Because if you don't, then you, go, you depend mostly on technology. Sure. Where you just press a button. Mm. But you can't just press a button and put the trumpet to your lips and it plays for you. You have to, pra you have to like practice it. So, um, Uncle, I would like to just know your perception of music from Africa to the world since you've been doing this for over 55 years. Well, I grew up in an age when there were songs, when people were able to sing along with melodies, you know what I mean? And uh, there are popular songs from like the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s, uh, 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 because People used to work very hard on songs, on rehearsing, and, 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 and they all played them with, it, with, you know, with instruments. I think that technology internationally has, has, has uh, uh, um, reduced music to like a common denomination, you know, where everybody programs, everybody does the same. Um, uh, you, you know, you can't sing along with the songs because there's no songs really, there's just beats and rhythms. Everybody's wearing dark glasses and like coming to the camera and doing that, and, you know. But the music behind them has been mostly, mostly has been programmed. And um, uh, when, when, when you program things, you really don't get a skill, you know. So today's music, not only in Africa, but all over the world, is like, um, 80% technology. And again, that is because we don't have any contact with our past. You know, uh, uh, we, 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 are, we are to a very great extent ruled by imitating yeah, American and Eurocentric moves, not only uh, in, in, in our entertainment and art, but even in our lives, you know. To the extent that like, um, uh, internationally, in the diaspora, the female population spends a hundred billion dollars a year on hair that doesn't belong to them. You know, and uh, 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 guys are threatened that if they don't pay for their, wo their women's hair salon expenses, uh, they might not get any action at night. You know, so... <laughs> So, I mean, we're, we're caught in a psychological anti-heritage trap, you know, and it's very sad because, like I said, I fear for your children. I look at my grandchildren and I fear for them, and I refuse to speak um, 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 uh, with my grandchildren and my children. I, I refuse, un unless they were born overseas and they haven't grown up with me, but I refuse to, to, to not speak the mother tongue to them because 
Um, I, 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 when I go to England, I don't hear anybody speaking Yoruba uh, uh, or, or Fanti, you know, uh, the way we speak English in our homes. And um, uh, um, it's, it's, it's all over the world. You find that the African people all over the world, we imitate other cultures. As a result, we don't sell anything, we buy. That's all we do is we buy. Yeah, so um, that's the story, unfortunately. And uh, so we're disappearing. We disappear, we're a disappearing civilization, Africans, and we're disappearing like form. And yet there is no society in the world that has um, heritage, wealth as diverse and as rich as Africans across the world. You know? But we don't know. As Africans, we don't know it. Mm. We're not interested in it. We think it's backward. We think it's barbaric. We think it's heathen. We think it's pagan. We think it's primitive. And I think it's the biggest curse that we have as a people. And I don't have anything <coughs> against. I don't have anything against people admiring other cultures. You know? I mean, you look at the Indians or the Chinese or the Thais or the Malays. Um, they really excel in things Western, but uh, uh, foreign things end at the gate. When they enter their homes, they are who they really are. You know, the Japanese the same, you know. <laughs> and, and these are all uh, industrially advanced nations, some of the greatest industrial nations in the world. But one of the reasons that they are so great is because their heritage keeps them together and drives them to do great things, you know. And they have, they don't even have, I mean, most of the people, have, the, 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 the societies I've talked about have a, a one song, variation on one song, you know, and maybe have one costume and one mm -hmm. dance, but it's the way they present it. When you arrive in their homes, they hit you with it. So it's very clear who they are. When you come to Africa, I mean, you know, my friends, uh, I grew up like telling them, because when I grew up, there was, you heard drums on the weekends, you know, even when I first came to, Ni to, to, to Ghana in the 1970s, into Nigeria, traditional life was like so uh, visible, so visible. Uh, uh, but today, you don't see it, you know, anywhere. And, uh, and the more you don't see it, the more we're buying from other countries. <clears throat> right now, back on um, the night with the legend where you'll be performing, I guess this is your second time of coming. What people will be expecting something new from you on the second coming? What new do you have? Now, most of the people who come to see us want to hear their songs. They're sure. their favorites, you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, they're for, for the last 40 years, some people have been listening and some children. Mm. Uh, when Ray, who know me were raised on the, their fathers or their grandfathers, grandparents' records, you know? Sure. And uh, we have to play their favorites first. Mm. Uh, otherwise, they just look at you like, what? Well, you know, like when Africans mostly, when you play songs they don't know, they just, unless like you really play the hell out of it, you know, then they go, oh yeah, that was good, but what about my song? So you, you, you have a, a list of uh, favorites you are going to hit them with? Yeah, I know we have a long list of favorites that people, you know, they want, they want to hear Stimela, the train song, they want to hear Lady, you know, the thing that we do with my fella. They want to hear um, Chileche, they want to hear The Marketplace, they want to hear Rekpete. Yeah. It's a long list. Long list. And if you don't play those songs, they just look yeah, at us yeah. like, why the hell did I come here? Right. Yeah. Sure. And then there's a few new things that we, but. The, we have an excellent band, same band from last year. Good. As a band, we've been together almost four years now. And everywhere we go in the world, you know, I mean, uh, we just pulverize um, the audiences. Sometimes I have to beg the guys not to play so good. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, <laughs> our show is basically nobody wants to sit down for too long, mm. you know. They all want to dance. and. Uh, so we are blessed in that way, but we have outstanding musicians. And three of the musicians in our band are under 30. 
mm. you know. But they're virtuosos at their, at their, at their instruments, and together as an ensemble, we, you know, we play very well together. And we work very hard on our craft. So there won't be real surprises, but um, there'll be a lot of joy, and uh, I, I, I especially like um, encourage the women not to wear high heels because they're going to be dancing most of the night. <laughs> okay, okay. I get to, I've got to understand that um, Ghana is like a second home to you because you love Ghana. What really do you love about this country? Well, you know, um, Ghana was introduced to me. I mean, I knew about Ghana, its history and all that. Uh, when I, I was a teenager, we all I admired them. The, 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 you know, Ghana was the first independent African country, and uh, we, we really admired the charisma and the, and, and the strength of Kwame Nkrumah and his colleagues. But then, in 1973, uh, I had visited like Fela uh, Kuti uh, uh, in Nigeria, and uh, he was a dear, dear friend of mine and a dear brother. And our friendship uh, um, was based mainly on our common uh, stand against um, uh, uh, corruption and establishmentarian, you know, theft and, 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 and autocracy. And um, uh, he was one of the funniest people that I've ever met. When we were together, we talked a lot of rubbish and laughed a lot. But he was also an outstanding musician, and his band was just something else. And in 1973, I came from America and, uh, and, and gave myself a pilgrimage to Africa, because I knew Africa through music and his culture. And I, I, I've lived in Senegal, in Guinea, in Ghana, in Nigeria, in the Congo, in Botswana, and spent a lot of time in other countries like Mali, and Togo, and Benin. And, and, and it just fascinated me. And I tried to like absorb as many uh, uh, positives from all the cultures. But uh, in 1973, Felak went on a tour of West Africa, and I, I, I was a guest in his band. And uh, I wanted to like play with African musicians. He said, "Listen, I'm going to West, all over West Africa, and everywhere we go, there'll be an opening band." And his first stop was Ghana. And here there was a band called. Uh, he said, "Well, everywhere we go, a local band will open for us." And here in Ghana was a band called Hedjole Sounds, open for him, and they just blew me away. So he left me, and I stayed here in 1973. And by um, the end of the 70s, I was already a citizen of Ghana, and we made more than six uh, uh, very popular recordings with that group, you know. And um, I'm married to a Ghanaian. Okay. And yeah, she's here with me, Elena. And uh, um, so I have a very, very close relationship with Ghana, Great. beyond music, yeah. Great. One last thing. Um, what would you like to be remembered for when you are no more with us? Well, I think uh, I would love to uh, be remembered for my passion for Africa, more than anything else, my passion for Africa, and um, um, uh, for like trying to instill heritage restoration and um, um, uh, fighting for uh, nature, for the environment. But most of all, uh, I think that uh, I, I'd like to be remembered for like appreciating the fact that if I wasn't from Africa, I wouldn't be anything. Sure. On that note, I want to say thank you very much. Um, you've been a source of inspiration to me too. I like you. Sense of humor. Okay. You're really funny. Thank well, you. I hope that you're gonna pay the bill I'm gonna send you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>